Um, so I've known, known Dave for longer than I might care to admit. And uh, I met him at a conference, uh, and I, I went up and introduced him myself. And this is because at the time I was using a, a Spark 32 system, which uh, maybe gives some context of the age of this story. Um, <laughs> And uh, the systems, when they would uh, panic, they, you get this ASCII art of this, this guy poking his tongue out a bit, a bit like that. And uh, so even before I met Dave, I knew, knew he had quite a good sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, over the years, I've learned uh, a few other things about Dave. Uh, he really likes sushi. He really likes coffee. But uh, maybe more relevantly, he's very passionate about, uh, about what he does. And, uh, his position in our community as, as the maintainer of the Linux networking stack. And uh, so I won't take up any more time. I've learned a lot from Dave over the years, and uh, I look forward to learning something new from him in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Simon. I really appreciate it. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about XDP. And I just want to let everyone know in this room that this will be my last talk about XDP ever. Actually, today. <laughs> and I want to assure everyone that we will be able to successfully complete this presentation because I've brought with me the power of the reverse Christmas tree. <laughs> so just be uh, confident knowing that he's going to help us get through this just fine. So what are we going to be talking about? Well, I'll give an overview of XDP and EPF, BPF, which you've probably seen a dozen times so far in this. but this conference, but I'm going to make sure I give you a little bit more context and more reasoning about why these architectural elements are important and well thought out, uh, which uh, I think needs to be reinforced when we talk about these things. Um, why is it a good long-term solution to certain problem spaces? I think that's a question a lot of people have when they say, well, this new XDP thing, what, what, why, why should we use it? What's it good for? And most importantly, I'm going to talk about frequent frequent myths that I hear about XDP. There's some, a lot of fake news out there. I'm going to use the reverse Christmas tree to help us get through that. And then we're going to talk about things that are true now, but will not be true for long, as long as uh, the, the momentum continues in the XDP space, which I'm completely confident about. And then I'm going to finish the talk and talk about a little, an observation I made that caused me to have an epiphany about e XDP development and something people might want to keep in line when they think about the environment that all this is happening in and what it may come to in the end, which I think is actually very exciting. So what is eBPF? So Jacobson and McCain back in 1992, which is what, 15 years ago or even longer, I mean, 20, 20, a long time ago, <laughs> realized that we needed some level of programmability inside the operating system. I think this is a really powerful concept, and I think these guys had no idea what, they, what kind of mess they were getting themselves into. Um, but they just needed it for simple packet filtering. So they built, they built a, a facility that solved that problem. But if you want to do something more sophisticated, you need something closer to a full-blown CPU, or something that looks like a real CPU. So that's why we came up with eBPF. Uh, Alexi worked on that. And what it provides is a full register set, 12, about 12 registers, full instruction set, even atomic operations, and um, a set of helpers, and more importantly, the fundamental concepts of data structures called maps. Why is it important to have an abstraction of the data structures in the design of eBPF? The reason is we want to retain one element of the basic BPF design that goes all the way back to 1992, which is that BPF programs cannot branch backwards. It's impossible to generate loops inside BPF programs. Therefore, the execution time of all BPF programs are well-bounded and can be well-defined, and they can't get out of this box of execution. So it's an important element to understand the design of BPF and why things were done that way. Well, OK, we have BPF. What can we use it for? Well, one of the many applications of BPF is XDP, and that's an important thing to understand as well. BPF isn't limited to networking. BPF is used for trace points and, all, and for selecting control groups of uh, sockets and things of this nature. It's not just limited to networking applications or specifically packet filtering. So what happens with XDP? The, as uh, Jesper and Andy showed, 
the XCP is an eBPF programming program executing exactly when the device driver receives the packet. It is the earliest point in time in which we can do anything with networking data that we receive on the system. It is by definition the fastest way we can process networking packets. It is the earliest point in time in which we can do so. So what do XCP programs do? They, 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 they make a determination and they return a, a result code. And the result code determines what happens with the packet. You can drop the packet. You can transmit it out the same interface. You could pass it up into the rest of the networking stack. And more codes will be coming in the future. Um, another thing to understand is that XTP programs can modify packet contents. Uh, the example uh, Andy and, and uh, Yes, for Gabe, is that you could switch the MAC addresses in one of the example programs in the tree, but you can do more sophisticated things like build tunnel headers, uh, do NAT, whatever you like, whatever your application actually needs in XTP. Uh, and so you can push and pull headers to implement tunneling as well, and that's important for various things, including uh, load balancing. Um, what is it fundamentally that makes XTP so fast? Well. I kind of got into this in the previous slide. It's the earliest point in time in the execution path in which we can actually look at the packet at all. So by definition, uh, that's a part of the, uh, what makes it so fast. The more, another aspect is that memory allocation is a large part of the transactional overhead for processing a packet in the networking stack. And every packet that we build for the full networking stack has to have an SK buff piece of metadata attached to it. And that thing is about 256 bytes, and it shows up in the profiles, the allocation of this thing for uh, high packet rate benchmarks and loads. So one thing XCP does, it eliminates the need for the metadata. We just work with completely linear packets, and we only give the XCP program a pointer to the beginning and the end of the packet, and that's it. We don't allocate any memory. We don't dedicate any allocation res uh, uh, compute resources to processing the packet. So another thing to think about XCP is it's, it's kind of stateless. Uh, yes, XCP has maps and can interact with other parts of the, of the kernel, but at its base design, it is completely stateless. The reason we need an SK buff to pass packets into the rest of the networking stuff because there's lots of state. There's sockets. There's uh, references to routes. There's references to packet filtering data. There's references to the uh, TC information. It's, just, it just, it's almost endless. Every single feature seems to need a new part of the SK buff, and it just makes it more and more overhead to process packets in, this tr in the kernel. So XCP kind of gets us out of that realm and gets us into a stateless area, which makes things go a lot faster. Uh, what kind of problem spaces is XCP well suited for? So, Jesper and company showed us that DDoS protection is one application. Facebook is doing this in production. Um, load balancing with XCPTX, Facebook is doing this in production. Uh, one thing that I like is you can generate custom statistics. Like, so let's say you know that you've got some kind of problem happening in your network. You don't know exactly what the traffic looks like, but you want to narrow down the scope of what, what's causing it. So you generate an XTP program which matches the kind of traffic you think is doing it and generate more detailed, fine-grained statistics on the events that are happening for packets flowing through your system. And then you could, in, in interest, you could look at them from user space and, see, and derive information that way. Um, you could do even more sophisticated things, like have a filter inside your XDP program and then generate a perf event that's well-defined that captures part of that packet or the entire frame, and then you could use perf to sample all the, things, all the packets that match your criteria. Um, the last one's like, uh, kind of like the, I know somewhere behind the scenes, someone's working on high-speed trading and thinking about using XDP for this, but they're probably not going to come here and give a presentation about that. That's going to be their secret sauce. Um, why is this approach awesome compared to uh, alternative schemes for this kind of thing? It's inside the kernel and it's integrated. Why is that important? Well, um, in the long term, it's going to be important for XDP to be able to coexist with the rest of the networking stack, and in particular, to gain, be able to gain objects to, to access to objects and tables within the kernel. It's not behind a wall to the point where it cannot interact with the rest of the kernel, and I think that's important. Uh, it, and how is it so? It's, eBPF is interesting because it, it's in a tightly controlled execution framework that can, can, can't just access arbitrary pieces of kernel memory. It can only access objects and pieces of data using the well-defined helpers and maps that are, uh, that are provided to eBPF programs. Um, so the way that we're going to be able to allow XDP programs to interact with other elements of the, net, the networking stack and other objects in the kernel is with these helpers. 
So that's something to look forward to in the future, and that's how we'll extend BPF over time. So I went into, I explained the, the no looping co uh, constraint, which is important for people doing networking. You want to know that your networking pipeline has a fixed cost and doesn't have vari variableness into it and uh, can't be exploited in that manner. So strictly bounded execution time is important for networking, and XDP gives us this. Okay. Here comes the fun part of the, the, the talk. So this, we're going to get a little bit of uh, audience participation here. So what's going to happen is I'm going to ask a question. And you'll know I'm asking a question because it'll have a really huge font up there. You won't, you'll know what's happening. And the appropriate answer for every single question is no. So I want everyone to say that when this happens. So we're going to do a test run, OK? We're going to use the reverse Christmas tree to help us get through today. Everything's going to be fine. Can XDP slice bread? No. You guys are pros. We're going to get through this just fine. All right, here we go. Is XDP just a fad? No. So XDP, as I've been trying to describe, is a long-term architectural solution. It is specifically designed to weigh the different needs of people trying to do high-speed networking operations. It's high performance, it's fully programmable, it's fully integrated into the kernel, and it's safe. Which leads me to, is XDP unsafe? No. That's right. XDP, I will argue, is no less safe than user space itself. How can I say that? The eBPF verifier, uh, verifier protects us from rogue EPF programs, right? And the various mechanisms in the kernel for implementing process, processes, memory management, etc., protect us from rogue user land programs. There is no fundamental difference between these two levels of safety, in my opinion. So if you argue that user land is safer, just realize that this is an emotional opinion of yours, and it has no basis in reality. So if you feel more comfortable in user space, that's fine. If you want to prove that user space is more safe, that's another matter altogether. I argue that XDP is just as safe as user space. Is XDP less flexible than DPTK? DPDK lives behind the wall of user space. Its fundamental weakness is its lack of integration into the kernel, the fact that it can't live with the rest of the facilities and subsystems that are inside the kernel in any way, shape, or form. If they want to do things to go into the, back into the networking subsystem, they have to re-inject packets into the kernel, and that means they're going to have to copy it back over the user kernel boundary, which blows away all the performance benefits that are supposedly the reason why we'd be using such a facility. And if you ask anyone who works on that stuff what the DPDK container story is, you'll get this. There is no answer to that fundamental question, and I think that's a, that's a really important limitation. Is XDP a replacement for NetFilter? TC, and other such facilities. That's right. XCP targets a specific kinds of use cases. And if you, this dude here, he's the jack, the jack of all trades. So that, that's not XDP on the screen there. That's, that's something else. It provides high performance packet, uh, high performance packet operations, very f extremely flexible policy decision making. And I think that's an important aspect to understand about BPF. So one thing that over time, if you've been in the kernel for a long time, you'll notice is that people keep asking for new interfaces and APIs to do all kinds of new things. It's basically, I've come up with this new policy decision-making mechanism I want to use for my use case. Please add this new API to the kernel so I can actually implement that policy decision-making. This doesn't scale. This is actually kind of terrible. The reason that it's terrible is that we'll make this new policy decision-making facility, you'll be using it for a year or two, and then you move on to something else, yet we have to hold on to that API in the kernel basically for eternity, and it's never going to go away. Whereas if we give people a, a, a mechanism like eBPF to implement their policy decision making however they please, in whatever way they want, we just need this. It solves the problem on a long term instead of uh, having these short term little ABI tweaks that we do all over the place, which I think is a really important aspect of eBPF. But for this power, there's a cost. There are some things it can't do. It's fundamentally stateless. So if you want to have a stateful kind of thing, you would have to build it yourself. But we have facilities that do this already. So the next thing to ask is, well, is there at least some overlap between these facilities and XDP and eBPF? And the answer is absolutely yes. There is overlap between these areas, but they're not replacements for each other. They're trying to solve two different aspects of the problem space. And I think that's really important to understand. 
So in the future, we're going to have a lot of things change, I hope, uh, a lot of improvements to the, uh, in particular to the user experience of running BPF programs. Uh, so Jesper and uh, Andy got into that. One thing people are asking for is introspection. Uh, so that means they want to be able to pull XDP programs that they've installed out and take a look at them and see if they installed the right one, for example. Uh, we do generate SHA-1 ID hashes for XDP pro for BPF programs, so you could at least in the initial stages, pull the uh, XDP program out and make sure it had the same hash that the one that you thought you installed. Um, the next element is debugging. Uh, this has been some discussion about this. We do want to add debugging uh, tagging to XDP programs, uh, BPF programs. And Dwarf 2 is pretty big and complicated. I guess you're up to Dwarf 4, Dwarf 5 now. So we've been looking at something called compressed type format. Compressed type format is a very simplistic way to describe data structures that are possible in, in the C language. And we could attach this debugging information to BPF programs to do all kinds of cool stuff. So for example, if we attach the uh, CTF info to the BPF program and the maps it's attached to, we could uh, pretty print them when, you when we pull them out of the kernel when we do an introspection. Uh, another thing that element to this that I think is really in interesting is we could trace XDP programs using perf events. So for example, you could put XDP into a debugging mode where you say, okay, don't use the JIT, use the interpreter, and as you execute every BPF instruction in my code, generate a perf event that's well structured with a reference to the CTF information so I could see it every, every I, can, I can trace the XDP programs that's running. We could do this on a probabilistic manner because you don't want to trace every single packet that comes through the system. You could say every 10,000 packets, run a trace and give me a perf dump with all the type information and everything. So that could be really useful. Uh, the tooling's not, it, it has been converging on a more consistent manner, but there's a lot of improvement for that area as well. So I think uh, another thing that's interesting is that uh, XDP programs can, as Facebook showed, can generate arbitrary perf events. And we could also we could leverage the CTF infrastructure to allow programs to define what types are, involved, are uh, including in those events. So they, if they just get spit out by perf, we could use CTF to figure out what the layout of the data structures are. So I think the whole argument about lack of introspection uh, will be solved. Uh, but I think there's another element to this discussion, which we're going to get into next. So I went to a place where they were teaching people how to use Arduino. And I sat there in an introductory Arduino class, and I wrote the usual introductory, the uh, first program everyone writes in Arduino just to flip the LEDs off and on. And basically how this works is you get this GUI, you write your little C program, and there's a bunch of well-defined entry points, and there's a set of well-defined helpers that you can call to interact with the device. And then when you're done, you click this button, which compiles it, and if it compiles successfully, it pushes it onto the device, and if everything goes correctly, the LED starts blinking. And I said to myself, I said, wait, this is just like writing XDP programs. This is very similar development cycle, and the workflow is almost identical. And if you think about it, any, we had such a huge class of people write Arduino programs, fashion designers, people designing the interiors and buildings and things like this. It's not limited to just computer people, which is kind of like a revelation that I think is quite important. So this, I kind of think that XDP can, can kind of move in this direction where people who are not kernel developers, people who don't specialize in this area like we do could be able to write simple programs to say, oh, I want to block uh, packets from this place because someone's attacking my machine at home. I can just write a little XDP program and I can make that work. I think that's kind of cool. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting to think about the previous slide where everyone complains that there's no introspection. Well, with Arduino, there isn't any introspection either. You push it into this black box and it either works or it doesn't. And you have to debug the little program in your GUI interface or whatever. So I think there's a lot of parallels there that uh, are qu quite interesting. So we're going to get there, things are going to get better, and we're going to have like uh, your neighbor, the plumber, running XDP programs. It's a very exciting future I have uh, as planned for everyone. Um, now it's time for some thank yous. I'd like to thank Dennis Tolvalt for making this incredible project for us to hack on every single day. I think it's, uh, it's easy to forget that uh, way back in the day he made a critical decision that created what we have right now at this moment, so that's really important. I'd like to thank Van Jacobson and Mick O'Roy because they, they created BPF and gave us this uh, interesting piece of infrastructure to build into a much bigger crazy beast. Uh, I'd like to thank Alexi and Daniel because they've been working on eBPF for a long time, giving us all the great infrastructure we have today. 
I'd like to thank Thomas Graf and Tom Herbert in particular because they've been thinking about how to use EPF, uh, eBPF in other interesting ways and what the long-term strategy is for all these amazing pieces of architectural infrastructure. Uh, I'd also like to thank Intel, Mellanox, and Netronome because they were the first to write at XDP support for their hardware. Uh, I think that was important that we had a couple drivers to for people, uh, reference drivers initially for people to actually use and see what XDP can do. And finally, I'd like to thank Jamal because he put this whole thing together. And if you have even an inkling into what's involved in writing, running an event of this uh, nature, uh, he really worked really hard and it's not easy. So I'd like to, everyone to give a round of applause for Jamal. <laughs> And I hope everyone looks forward to my non-XDP talk at the next NetDev presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? We have time. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank Dave. Um, uh, XDP is, you know, solving a lot of problems and making performance um, for a lot of this traffic that should have been dropped um, at the right place, you know, um, happening. Uh, I do have um, one question, and maybe, um, you know, you have... When we started with XDP, there was one um, thing we said, it is hardware agnostic in some sense. Um, the action, which is X XDP TX action, uh, which is to forward packet, uh, to see performance on that, um, you know, the only way we can do it is in a hardware-aware manner, where you have an XDP TX queue per core dedicated for, you know, sending a packet out, um, which leads to some driver model change. Uh, so it's not totally hardware agnostic in that sense, which, uh, you know, is not a bad thing. <laughs> so I'll but say this in a different way. It's there's two things. First of all, at some point in the not too distant future, I want to have a generic XDP implementation that's such that any driver, you could have any device whatsoever and at least experiment and play with XDP. It's the first point. The second point is, uh, if you want the full performance of XDP TX, yes, absolutely, you need to do some special stuff in your driver, and this applies to XDP support fundamentally. Right. Uh, third thing is uh, we do have plans for something that's going to test those boundaries and uh, the limitations of that kind of design where we're going to try to have a, something called an XDP redirect where you could send to another device altogether. Yeah. So yes, that's a very important uh, point. Like uh, the XDP TX support to be f optimal, it needs to be done in a driver specific manner and that's an important point right. to make. Uh, yeah, I, also, I also want to say that one thing I do want to see is I want to see anyone who does goes to the trouble of doing XDP support for a specific driver that they implement the full feature set. Because we don't want a situation where people can't load certain programs on a particular kernel release because the driver author said, oh, I'm not want to bother with XDP TX. So we, we should really make it a requirement to support the whole suite of facilities. Yeah, th th that was my point. Like, if we can understand that requirement over there from the hardware, it'll be really easy to design the driver around it and the device. So Yes, okay. I agree. Anybody else? Oh, let's give him another round of applause, but don't leave yet. Let's just give him an applause. Thank you. Thank you.